Hi, I'm James. Uh, I have a company called Suma. We work a lot on cross-chain interoperability. Um, we work right now with the Interchain Foundation, with the Zcash company, and with a few other layer one chains to add uh, typically Bitcoin features to a layer one. Um, so uh, uh, as part of this, we've started an organization called the Crosschain Group, which is a trade group for people working on multiple blockchains. If you're interested in getting involved, you can go to crosschain.group. Yes, that is a real URL. Dot group is a real TLD now. Um, OK, so this talk is about all the different ways of organizing cross-chain communication that we know of. We're going to cover like eight or nine things from a very high level pretty quickly. Uh, and um, I hope that we have a little bit of time for questions afterwards. It doesn't look like anyone in this room is going to tell me I can't take questions, so I'm going to try to do it. Uh, okay, so um, one of the first like attempts at cross-chain interoperability was called BTC Relay, and this launched on Ethereum like three or four years ago. And the way it works is essentially that you have the Bitcoin blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain, and you're taking stuff from Bitcoin and you're just shoving it into Ethereum. You take the headers and you just shove them into a smart contract. Um, so the goal is that the Ethereum smart contract tracks the latest header of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, unfortunately, BTC Relay has been dead for about two years at this point. Um, they ended up storing something like 10 slots per header, which meant 200,000 gas per header. So tracking an hour of Bitcoin cost 1.2 million gas. Uh, not really sustainable, especially when no one was using it for anything. Um, so we came up with a bunch of additional like ways to achieve the same goal, and one of them is the skip block relay. Um, compared to BTC relay, you're going to take some headers and shove them over to Ethereum, and then you're just going to skip the next 2,000 headers. Uh, so the main thing here is that we're trying to cut down on gas costs by just not forwarding thousands of headers. Um, not forwarding thousands of headers also cuts down on the security model a little bit. So with the difficulty relay that we came up with, you forward two headers out of every 2016, and you may not get like an accurate picture of Bitcoin consensus at every point, but you do get an accurate picture of what the current Bitcoin difficulty is. Um, and we authenticate that using just a bunch of proof of work and validating the Bitcoin difficulty adjustment algorithm, which is actually really painful to do in Solidity. Okay, so we have BTC relay where we're taking every header as it comes in, sending it over to Ethereum. We have the skip block relay, which is we're taking two out of every 2,000 headers and sending them over. Um, and we're actually having a, we have a worse security model for the skip block than we do for BTC relay. And I thought we could do a little better. And so we started working on something we call the minimal relay. Uh, the goal of the minimal relay is basically just to build BTC relay, but do it right this time. Um, and so what the minimal relay does is instead of storing the headers, uh, you take the headers, you put them on Ethereum, and then you delete them from Ethereum. Um, so instead of storing the headers, which are 80 bytes, which is three Ethereum slots, or 60,000 gas, uh, and instead of storing the height, which is another slot, which is another 20,000 gas, uh, you actually just store the links between headers. You upload a header, you validate it, and then you throw it away, and you store the hash of the header. Um, you store the hash of the parent indexed by the hash of the header, and that costs one slot to store. Um, and every fourth block, we store the height of that block. And so this consumes 1.25 slots per header instead of 10 slots per header. So you can see already we have something like an 85% gas savings. Um, this we've been running on Ropsten for about three months now. Um, so we've just been shoving tens of thousands of Bitcoin headers onto Ropsten. Uh, the contract validates the header chain it drops all the headers, and it just stores the links, because a blockchain is just a bunch of links. Um, we can always re-upload the headers if we need to read them, uh, and we can use the link store to validate any data that we upload. 
Um, so instead of storing an 80 byte header, every time you want to read a header, you have to pass 80 bytes back up to the chain, which validates it against the store and then discards it again. Uh, so that way we actually save like 80 to 85% of the gas costs off BTC Relay. Um, okay, so uh, a lot is, we've covered like cross-chain comms, Bitcoin to Ethereum. Uh, we're gonna move over into cross-shard communication, which is actually an equivalent problem. Um, there's no functional difference between communicating between chains and communicating between shards. Uh, shard is a fancy word for chain that we designed to make this easier. Um, so ETH2, you can think of it as a thousand shards or you can think of it as a thousand different chains. And uh, you're actually gonna be closer to reality if you think of it as different chains. All right, so we have a bunch of fun strategies available to us in sharded systems because we get to design the system to be friendly to this. Um, ETH2 has this concept called cross-links. Uh, every finality period, which is on the order of like six minutes in ETH2, uh, the beacon chain, which is at the center of everything, references all of the other shards. So the beacon chain includes a cross-link to a thousand other shards, and each shard every six minutes or so includes a cross-link to the beacon chain. And it looks kind of like this. Oh, do I have a laser pointer? Oh, I do, sweet. Okay, so we have the beacon chain here in the middle and it's pointing out to this shard and we have this shard pointing to the beacon chain and if you wanna pass a message, you put it on your shard, you wait for the beacon to finalize the finalization of your shard. So you wait for this to finalize, then you wait for that to finalize and then this cross link takes the message where it's intended for. Uh, so this takes about 12, 13 minutes in the best case. In the worst case, it could be forever because this is a blockchain and we don't have any guarantees about its behavior. Um, and uh, you know, really what we're doing is just using the fact that it's a sharded system and we designed it to have these cross links to make communication possible. Um, 12 minutes is an awfully long time for one transaction, particularly if you're sending money around. Uh, typically, I use a blockchain for money or like money-ish things. Uh, and if I have to wait 12 minutes for my trade to occur on Uniswap while my trade is publicly committed to, someone's gonna front run me. And so you gotta ask yourself, can we do like better than this cross shard, cross link communication stuff? And I think the answer is yes, but you have to get a little weird. Um, so we came up with this idea that we've been running by the ETH2 team called consensus introspection. And the idea here is basically ETH2, the beacon chain coordinates all of the validators of every shard. So if you look here, the beacon chain is choosing here the people who create these blocks, right? So the beacon chain knows the future of every remote chain, right? And if we have a cross link to the beacon chain like this, uh, then we can read the future of every other shard in the system. Not like the whole future, just their validator sets. And so we have this consensus introspection idea where this chain reads the validators for this block and can then validate that they have signed a message even though the crosslink has not occurred and they do not have, you know, shard A, whoops, whoa, there we go. Shard A does not have 100% certainty that that message has been confirmed and finalized, but can behave as if it does because it knows that either this message will be confirmed and finalized or the validators will be slashed for equivocation. Um, so it turns out you can kind of take advantage of the fact that the beacon coordinates everything to read a remote shard, a remote shard subjective future, which sounds really confusing because it is. It's very non-intuitive that you can do this. Um, this is quite complex to implement and to explain to people. Like obviously I'm having trouble explaining it even though I like designed this system. Um, so 
basically we're taking advantage of the fact that the beacon decides the future of every shard in order to get some bounds on what the future can possibly contain, and then we can act on those bounds. All right, this is why it's called exotic cross-chain communication uh, instead of normal. Okay, the other thing you can do in a sharded system, or really in any cross-chain system, is just build credit markets. Rather than trying to have the chain solve all the problems for us, we should just build a market and let other people solve it for us. Um, so we've done a bunch of like work and thinking about this. Uh, if I wanna send ETH to a remote shard, I could actually just have Mark, who's already on that shard, send it for me, and I can pay him back later. So I'll commit to paying Mark over here, and he can see that because he's an off-chain actor. Uh, and he can say, okay, James has paid me. Uh, I'll go ahead and make this payment on this remote shard for him. And I know that I'll get my money back when this message comes over here through the crosslinks, so through a slower communication mechanism. So really what I'm doing is I'm relying on some market to exist to, uh, that I can pay to make my transactions go faster. Um, obviously I'm gonna have to pay a bit of a spread. Uh, this service is valuable, so I'm gonna have to pay for it. Um, and there's a bunch of other like weird problems. Uh, I can't necessarily send any secrets or any signatures. If Mark has an incentive to interfere with my transactions, he might do so. So if he wants to front run me, he can definitely do that. And uh, Mark probably knows why I'm sending that ether somewhere. If I'm sending it to Uniswap, he probably knows what I'm gonna buy. If I'm sending it to Maker, he knows I need to recollateralize my CDP. So he can figure out how much it's worth to me and try to extort me for that amount. Um, so while we think this is possible, there's a lot of like weird considerations that are not just like mechanism based, they're use case based. And that's one of the very non-intuitive results in cross-chain communication is that the technical structure you use has to depend on the use case. And that means that we can't abstract this away and provide a single unified communication channel for everything. It means that the developers of an application have to know exactly what the communication channel is good for and what they can and can't do with it. Um, so this is gonna remain very complex for a very long time. Uh, and building good, good cross-chain apps is going to remain very difficult for the foreseeable future. And imagine the world in ETH2 where we have literally a thousand chains and you see like why this is a problem that we've been thinking about a lot recently. Okay, so one of the like more out there ETH2 ideas is that you know we invented these shards so everything could run forward asynchronously. What if we just uh, made them synchronous? What if we just like took some shards and made them synchronous again? And so the idea is that we have a tight crosslink between shard A and shard B for some period of time, right? So these blocks are created at the same time and for a few, hundred or thousand blocks, it's like they're part of the same chain. Um, the downside here is like, this is what we invented sharding to get rid of, is synchronous updates, because synchronous updates slow down the system. Uh, so if we're making pairs of shards, we're giving up 50% of the capacity of the system. Um, so I don't think this is worth pursuing, but it is like really simple to reason about and really simple to implement. Um, the other thing worth knowing is that, you know, there's a thousand shards. If we're trying to like wait for shard one and shard 733 to pair up, that's gonna take a thousand pairing periods, you know, like on, av on average, we don't know. Maybe 500 on average? I gotta learn how statistics works. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, 500 pairing periods, a pairing period is like a thousand blocks, maybe. Uh, that means it's gonna take days and days before we can communicate with the shard we want to in a synchronous fashion. Um, and that's one of the other lessons about this that's not intuitive, is there has to be waiting. No matter what strategy you're using, you have to wait. If it's crosslinks, you have to wait for finality. If it's synchronization, you have to wait for things to come into sync. If it's SPV proofs, you have to wait for remote finality. 
Uh, generally speaking, we can't get rid of long 10 minute plus waiting periods in cross chain or cross shard communication. Um, it's a built in fact, we can hide it, we can do it up front, we could try to split it up between a few different steps, but you still gotta wait. All of this is going to uh, just naturally and definitionally be slower than doing things on a single chain. Uh, but, it seems like single chains don't work for smart contracts, so that's why we're building ETH2 in the first place, right? Uh, ETH1 doesn't do what we want, so we gotta get rid of it. Okay, so this is the section where we get like real weird and into very new stuff, um, and I'm gonna talk about ZK rollout for a minute. Um, ZK rollout, the idea is like a month and a half old. Um, we just started specking this out in the last two weeks. I gave a short talk on it at ZK Summit, so go look that up after this. Uh, it'll go into a lot more depth than this does. But the basic idea is that we are going to take ZK Rollup and apply it to multiple blockchains. Um, if you're familiar with ZK Rollup, what it is is an off-chain state and on-chain transactions. So the chain just like hosts a blob of transactions and doesn't evaluate them it sees the root state of the system and the transactions that affect it. And the chain in ZK rollup also sees a validity proof, um, a zero knowledge proof that these transactions moved the state from this root to that root. Uh, okay, so in roll out, we're going to take one giant tree and we're gonna split the transactions into uh, different sub trees, right? So this is the Ethereum subtree, and transactions affecting it are in this blob, and the Tezos subtree, let's say, and those transactions go in this blob. Okay, so the full state update looks kind of this, like this. We have the old rollout route, we've got a bunch of transactions, and we've got the new route, and under that is all of these different subtrees. Um, and an update, on chain, what actually gets committed to on chain is this. We have the validity zero knowledge proof, we have the old root, the new root, and we have the transactions that affect that chain's subtree. So the Tezos chain sees the Tezos subtree transactions, the Ethereum chain sees the Ethereum subtree transactions, but they all see a proof that the whole tree progressed correctly, right? So I can move my ether in and out of the ether subtree, I can move it from the ether subtree to the Tezos subtree, and I can move it out from the Tezos subtree to the Tezos chain. Um, at each step, every chain sees a proof that the whole tree moved correctly. What they don't see is transactions affecting other subtrees, all right? And so you get an update commitment that looks like this. We've got our validity proof and our transactions for Ethereum. Um, and we put it alongside and make a new chain. Uh, I actually got these numbers backwards. This should be three, and uh, there's two threes and they're in the wrong place entirely. So just ignore all the numbers. Um, we have a roll out chain that progresses alongside each other chain. And each chain can reference the rollout chain and we can move assets in and out. Uh, but we only have like Cosmos model of asset authentication, right? Is we're getting this rollout chain that progresses and we can move assets in and out of it. But unless it is an asset from that chain, we have no way of measuring wh whether that asset's any good. We know that we have some representation in this tree we don't know if the representation is hyperinflated. We don't know if it represents just a pile of beans. We don't know what it is or where it came from, but we know we have a representation. And so the goal of rollout is not to affect like direct state reading. What it actually does is lets off-chain actors have complete visibility of the system and decide whether it's valid or not. Um, so in the best case, you know, things move nicely, you have your ether, you can move it out to Tezos. The Tezos chain doesn't know that ether's any good, but you as the off-chain actor do. Uh, the goal of rollout is not to have a perfect system, it's to have off-chain actors be able to assess the validity of the system at all times. 
and have all the information that they need to make that decision. Um, it's equivalent to the Cosmos IBC model. Um, so rollout is really new and a little weird, and we don't know exactly how to build it yet. We have a bunch of guidelines. We know how a lot of uh, collateralization and slashing needs to work. Uh, because again, like Tezos doesn't reference Ether, and Ether doesn't reference Tezos, so they can't tell if the remote chain's rollout commitments failed. And that means that we need to have someone collateralized on each chain operating the rollout chain. Okay, so the rollout can fail in a number of different ways. You can have a subtree halt, and this is actually an expected like, part of the system. Um, so if Tezos just falls down and never makes another block again, the goal, you know, the outcome should be that the Tezos subtree doesn't confirm transactions anymore. Um, you can have a full system halt. So if the operator commits to two conflicting state updates, we can always detect that on every chain and halt the entire system and burn down any bonds the operator has on every chain. Um, and you can have a uh, representation inflation. Oop, there we go. We're back. Um, so any asset that is from a remote chain, the operator can, after a waiting period, inflate. And the goal of the waiting period, again, is to give the off-chain actors the ability to assess the validity of the system and respond to that attack. So the security model here isn't that the operator can't create assets, it's that if they do, they will be un unable to monetize it. All right, we have three minutes for questions according to this little clock. Uh, does anyone have something? Yes. Um, so the question is, given all the difficulties with sharding, cross-chain communication, do I think that sharding is the solution for scaling? Um, I think that we are hard-pressed to find any other potential solutions. Uh, I think that just definitionally, when you shard something, you give up contract composability. Uh, you damage the fungibility of the assets involved. So like shard A ETH and shard B ETH can't be used for the same thing. Therefore, definitionally, they're non-fungible. Um, but nobody else seems to have any better ideas. We are quite sure that consensus systems can't scale up to processing the level of like transactional throughput that we want out of them. <laughs> Uh, yes. So, uh, you didn't the inflation attack on rollout. Um, the way it works is that let's back up a second. Uh, this one. There we go. So, uh, this one. So we have Tezos over here is getting these transaction commitments that affect its subtree, and Ether seeing these transactions that affect its subtree. So Ether actually has no way of verifying tr that Tezos being moved from the main chain to the rollout is any good, okay? So the operator is free to just create represented Tezos in the rollout, and the Ether chain won't know about it. And so the operator may be slashed on Tezos for doing this, but we cannot halt Ether. We cannot halt the Ether rollout updates based on the Tezos slashing because we're not assuming any other communication channel. And so the operator will just mint, you know, infinity Tezos wrapped rollout assets um, and move those over to Ether. And so the goal of the waiting period is that someone can tell that this has happened, tell that the Tezos updates have halted, and uh, get out of the wrapped Tezos asset before the operator can monetize the attack. Uh, yes? Uh, so have I done any research into like congestion control for shards? Uh, no, because like fundamentally your state lives on some shard and that shard has a maximum throughput. You can't have state that lives on multiple shards um, and you can't remove the transactional throughput cap from a shard. Uh, so congestion control will always be an issue. Um, 
there's like no way to load balance transactions across shards because they affect specific state, and that state has a home. Um, anyway, that's uh, all the time we have. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, you can find me out in the hallways after this.